Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome to the next episode of Elder Law 101, uh, the 12 episode series that I'm doing uh, this year that really ideally deals with all issues that you would ever want to know about if you're talking about Elder Law. So today we're going to be talking about the post-mortem to-do list, that is, what are you supposed to do after you're dead. Uh, you may recall that we have been doing this series now for quite a while. Uh, in the first, we, we're all, always following my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, in the initial episode, uh, we talked about um, dealing with issues that they might have dealt with when they were been, before they were 60. In the next episode, we dealt with, we, we dealt with issues during their 60s. Uh, we, then we talked about Frank and Mary in their 70s. In the fourth episode, which actually happened during tax season, we talked about tax, tax, income tax issues. Uh, next, we talked about Frank and Mary in their 80s. Then we had a separate episode that talked about qualifying for mass health, which tends to be an extremely important issue uh, if you're in your 80s and your 90s because you, you folks are worried about being frail, needing care at home, needing nursing home care. Um, then we talked about, uh, in the last episode, we talked about Frank and Mary during the last year of their lives. Today, in this episode, Frank and Mary are dead. So we're trying to figure out what to do at that point. Um, and in the remaining episodes, we're going to talk about other issues. Now, today we're not going to talk about what would have to be done if any of the assets of Frank and Mary were in trust. That's what we're going to talk about next month. We're going to talk about all, all the, basically all, all of, not all, the three major kinds of trusts uh, that, that Frank and Mary may have had an interest in doing while they were alive uh, and how each one of those would get handled after they die. Uh, then later we're going to talk about issues with their kids and their grandkids. Uh, they, we're we're going to talk about looking at Medicare, which is always an important issue, and which we're going to talk about in November when it's Medicare, Medicare open enrollment time. And then finally, in Christmas time, we're going to talk about tax planning and uh, giving. So today we're talking about Frank and Mary, my old friends, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. I always tell people if you're old enough to get the joke, you're old enough to be my client. Um, and, but, to, but today we're talking um, not about Frank and Mary themselves, uh, but about um, what happens after they're di dead. Because you know, when, when Mary died, or excuse me, in, with the example we always give is that Frank died first, and when Frank died, we don't know exactly what happens to Frank's after he dies. We don't know if he goes to heaven, we don't know if he goes to the other place, we don't know if he gets reincarnated as an elephant or something, but the point is, for, for purposes of this life, he's gone. Uh, and the question is always how to deal with the re things. Now typically, uh, when Frank died, like in, in this case, if Frank died, then there would have been no need for probate because assets typically would have been owned by Frank and Mary jointly. <clears throat> the legal rule is that if you own something jointly with someone and you die, your interest evaporates at that moment the survivor becomes the sole owner, so there's no need for going through the probate process. Things get very simple. Um, the question, though, is what happens then when Mary dies? Once again, we're not exactly sure what happened as far as her spirit is concerned. As far as her stuff, though, we need to deal with it. So the question is, um, how do we deal with Mary's earthly goods? And of course, the first thing that we need to deal with the moment that Mary dies uh, is her remains. Because when Mary dies, her body, she's no longer Mary. At that point, um, legally, there, are, there is this body and it is the remains. And the question is then, who's in charge of dealing with the remains and how do the remains get dealt with? Well, if Mary died leaving a will uh, and, and her will said, named a personal representative and said that she wanted that personal representative to be in charge of those remains, then that actually qualifies that person to take care of everything, even though the will, of course, at that point has not been probated. Uh, it, it's a way that the legislature, legislature had of handling that issue. So if she's done that, that takes care of everything. If she hasn't done that, but she's left some set of personal instructions, then chances are that's going to be uh, adequate. What I always suggest to clients is, before they die, you may want to talk to someone at a funeral home, uh, do a set of instructions regarding how things are going to be, how your remains are going to be treated after you die. Uh, you, if, you're, if you're dealing with the funeral home, 
you can at that point prepay for whatever, uh, what, however the, the, uh, for, for all of those services. If you do that, then there's a state law that says that that payment ends up getting held in escrow until you die. Um, and then following your death, then the funeral director or the funeral home uh, will implement those plans and at that point can pay themselves the money that is being held together with interest. The point is, you can do that set of plans um, before you die. If you don't though, um, then the question is, who has control of your remains? And the answer is, uh, your heirs, uh, first your spouse and then the kids. I've had the situ unfortunate situation where someone had died um, <clears throat> and the person who had died, there had been a, a second marriage. Uh, and so there ended up being a, a, a disagreement between the children um, of her, from her first marriage and the, the, the uh, surviving spouse. Uh, the children wanted the surviving spouse to not be able to go to the funeral, right? And I had to go talk to the funeral director and, and explain to him that actually, legally, because there were no written instructions, the surviving spouse was in control of the remains and actually had the ability to exclude the children from the funeral. So the point is, um, the, the, as in so much of estate planning, the goal is to have a plan and ma to make it as clear as possible. What to do then? It's all about whatever you wanted to do. And believe me, the best thing you can do for your kids is to get all of this stuff in writing before you die to make sure that the kids know what you want so that they're not arguing about it. Remember, the moment of your death will be a very, very uh, emotionally charged moment and dealing with your death is always hard for children. It makes it even harder if they're trying to figure out what you wanted after you're dead. It's very much like the healthcare proxy problem where you try to give instructions so that anyone who is handling your medical affairs um, um, when you're incapacitated knows ahead of time what you want. So, um, you know, there are any number of things that can happen regarding your remains. Uh, you can be buried. There may be a burial plot. You may have purchased a plot. You may have inherited a plot. Uh, the rules regarding those burial services are all controlled by uh, the cemetery commission, where that, wherever that cemetery is. What you own when you own a burial plot is not the actual land. What you own is the right to have your remains put into a piece of that land. As to the rules of the control of that plot, it's almost totally in the discretion of the cemetery commission. And of course you can always have your body um, cremated. You probably want to tell folks ahead of time if you want to, if you want to have that done. Uh, so but the point is um, you want to be dealing with these issues um, before you die so that it'll be clear for your kids after you die. <clears throat> then of course there's the question of what to deal with, how to deal with everything else. And our, we're assuming here that Mary had a house. She may have had an IRA uh, or other tax deferred funds. She may have had a bank account that was in her name. Um, re remember, in this case, if she had been, if these assets had been joint with Frank, then at the moment of his death, she would have become the sole owner. Then, of course, there's the stuff, the personal property, the car, which is a special case. We're going to talk about the car, U.S. savings bonds, various other issues. So the question is how to deal with all of that stuff after Mary dies. So dealing with the stuff, when I talk about the stuff, I'm talking about the tangible personal property, which means anything that you can touch, uh, that, but that isn't real estate. So we're not talking about stocks, bonds, things that, things that, are, are, that are intangible, uh, but, just the, but just the stuff. So the ideal, if there are particular items that you wanna have given to particular people, is that you do a list, and that you actually in that list name who is going to be getting what, and then if you have a will, in your will you say specifically that it is your intention um, um, through, the, um, through the will that if you've left that kind of a list, typically called a memorandum, that that's going to be legally binding, right? That's probably the best way that you can, that you can uh, handle that. The one question that often comes up, especially if, um, if, you, if Mary died in an apartment, is how can people get access to all of that? So one of the things that you can really help your children with, especially if you're living in senior housing or any kind, of, any kind of housing where there may be a question following your death of people getting access in order to deal with this stuff, is talk to the management. Talk to the folks there. Find out if there's a form you can if you need to fill out, if there's anything that you need to do in order to assure that after you've died 
people are going to, your folks are going to get access to all of that. And then, then of course, there's the question of what if there is a fight? Now, I have been doing this work for about 45 years. Um, I have yet to have a case where there was such a fight over the tangible personal property that anything needed to be argued out in court, right? So usually there isn't. People just divide things up. And if the question is, do you need to go through the probate process to deal with the tangible personal property? Typically the answer is no. And the reason is, if there is tangible personal property and it's going to get, and it's going to get sold, and I'm gonna buy some of it, if there's gonna be a yard sale, I'm not gonna really care if somebody can show me a will and show me that you know, the right person owns that. I'm just gonna say, here's my money, give me the item, right? So, so typically these is those issues don't, don't arise. So if you're worried about that, if you're in a situation where um, you've got tangible personal property but everything else that you own is in joint names with other people, chances are there's never gonna be a probate on any of this. You may not even need a will. Um, the car. The car, is, on the other hand, is the most common, co you, common cause of a, what I call an accidental probate um, because a car has a title. And if you die um, with that title, the only way that anybody can transfer that car to anyone is by going through some form of the probate process, getting appointed as your representative, and then being able to sell, sell the car. Now, people, folks will tell me, well, you know, but you know, the car's not worth anything. It's a junk. That's even worse because you have to go through that process whether it's a $50,000 Mercedes or whether it's a you know, $1,000 junk. So um, the question is how to deal with that. So uh, the, the best way to deal with it is to make sure that the car gets transferred before you die. What I typically tell people is, you know, what you really want to do is whoever you've named as your power of attorney agent, tell that person, look, if I'm, if I'm getting sick, if it looks like I may die soon, go to the registry, take my power of attorney, take the, the title to the car, and of course you have to tell them where the title to the car is, uh, and transfer the car to yourself. Uh, and you'll, which you'll be able to do right there because you're gonna be at the registry, you can just fill in all the forms. Um, and then um, take the car and do with it what I tell you. So of course, if, in order to do this, you need to trust the power of attorney agent, but presumably that's why he's your power of attorney agent. If you haven't done that, then what someone is going to need to do, unless there's a larger probate that is being filed because you have substantial assets, is to file a so-called low value probate. The, uh, this uh, process is available when, when the total amount of the assets of the deceased, not counting the car, is less than $25,000. So if, if there's, if the, whatever the car's value is, you can use the low value probate option. If it's a $50,000 car, that's okay because the, the value of the car doesn't count. And if that's the case, then you file a special form with the uh, Registry of Probate. You fill in the form, you show what the value of the other assets is, you show that they don't add up to more than $25,000. Typically, um, that um, low value estate will get approved almost immediately. There's no need for, for special notices in the paper and any of that jazz. And then you can take that document with you uh, to uh, sell the car. By the way, that same, you're gonna use that same technique uh, if, if, the, your, if your um, mother or father or whoever died leaving small bank accounts. Um, you, you're gonna get approved, you're gonna list those small bank accounts, including the account numbers on the, uh, on the uh, probate form. Uh, you're gonna get approved, you're gonna then be able to go to the, uh, to the bank with that document and close out that account, get a check um, payable to whoever is named as the um, personal representative. So that's how you handle the car. Jointly owned property. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, jointly owned property is presumed to be owned by the survivors. So if I own something, so in Frank and Mary's case, they own their house jointly, they own bank accounts jointly. The moment that Frank died, his interests evaporated, Mary became the sole owner. In this case, if Mary has put other names onto all of those accounts, including the house, um, then, then at the moment of her death, it is presumed that her interests evaporated and these other people, the survivors, became the owners of that property. I should mention, though, um, that th 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 that, that uh, ownership, that presumption of ownership is only a presumption, which can be rebutted. Um, the most common cause of what I'll call family feuds, disagreements among the family going through this probate process, is a fight between 
the, the person who is named as the personal representative under the will, who then files the will and gets it approved, and someone who is named as the surviving joint owner on a bank account or on the house, um, especially with bank accounts, um, the, 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 folk, the person then who has, who has started the probate and is the personal representative will say at court, oh, you know, my mother never put, put my sister's name on that account as a joint owner, meaning that she'd get all the money, but only as a convenience because my sister was helping out with her financial matters, et cetera, right? And, and that argument, as I say, that's the most common cause of, uh, of a fight. So, so it is not necessarily guaranteed that there'll be no probate, but chances are that will avoid the probate process. Regarding other items, life insurance policies, IRAs, investment accounts, if you die um, and you have specified that at the time of your death, those assets are going to a particular person, which always is the case with life insurance. You, you can't buy a life insurance policy unless you've named the death beneficiary, which should be the case regarding the IRA, regarding your IRAs or 401ks, any tax deferred funds. Typically you would have named a death beneficiary. Um, then in all of those cases, when you die, the death beneficiary will simply need to file a claim form with the insurance company or with the, the bank or other entity that's holding the IRA and the bank will pay them directly. And if you've named multiple people, if you've named several of your children, for example, on the IRA, then each of them will file their own claim form and each of them will get their own check uh, for their portion of the proceeds. Regarding investment accounts, if you have investment accounts, <clears throat> excuse me, don't assume that you, because you have the investment account that therefore upon your death, your kids are gonna get the money or whatever. Make sure you check with the entity that is holding those funds to see and make sure that you file the death beneficiary forms. This is especially important, by the way, regarding all of these issues. When, when Frank died and Mary became the survivor, it may very well have been that at that time she had a life insurance policy or other assets which named Frank as the death beneficiary. If she doesn't change that death beneficiary to name her kids or whatever, when she dies, all of those assets, they don't, the money doesn't get kept by the insurance company, but all of those assets now become a part of Mary's probate estate. There's of course the house. If the house was in, was in joint tenancy with some of the kids, then at the moment of Mary's death, the kids would become the owners of the house. In, 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 in the case of real estate, there's a second alternative, which I often recommend to folks who are trying to avoid probate, which is, that you give your children or whoever you want to leave the property to a so-called remainder interest in the property. That is the interest that remains after you die. You keep a life estate in the property so that you keep control of it while you're alive. If you've structured things that way, then upon, upon your death, your interest evaporates. The new owner, uh, the remainder man becomes the sole owner of the property and no probate is necessary. Uh, finally, what if you didn't do this? What if you didn't do all of these things or any of the, or regarding some asset? And, and remember, if, if you're, one of your goals is to avoid probate, and that is a very common goal for a lot of folks, then the way to figure out whether you're avoiding it is to look asset by asset. And regarding each one of those assets, take what I've just talked about and figure out if you've dealt with it. If you've made all the accounts joint, if, you, if regarding the house you've done a a, a deed out of a remainder interest but kept the life estate. Uh, if you've made sure that you've got death beneficiaries on all the other assets. Look at each one of the assets and that's the best way to avoid probate. But what if you haven't done that? Here's what probate is about. First of all, the point of probate. The point of, pro probate has two points. One, to figure out who gets what. If you have a will, then all of your assets will be divided according to the terms of your will. If you don't have a will, the assets will be divided according to the rules of intestacy, the rules that apply when there is no will. Uh, oftentimes people will tell me, I need a will, otherwise my assets are gonna go to the state. Trust me, they will never go to the state. If you die leaving assets, there will always be a cousin. There will always be a somebody who will show up to claim those assets. The point is though, that before those assets can get distributed to anyone, creditors have to get paid. And, and, and creditors will have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against your probate estate, uh, which is the reason why probate always takes at least a year, because your assets can't be distributed, whether you have a will or not, can't be distributed to anyone until at least a year and a day following your death. By the way, as a result of changes in the law that were made 
at now actually almost 10 years ago. You can also avoid those creditors if you want, and chances are you will avoid them by simply waiting until a year and a day after you've died, of course this won't be you, but your family, by having them wait until a year and a day after you've died to file those in the probate court. Because in order for a creditor to preserve their claim, they need to have sued the estate and, filed a cl and, and notified the estate that they had, that they had filed that suit. If, if no probate is filed, right, and they haven't sued and haven't notified somebody, then they're going to be wiped out a year and a day after you die. Um, so so this, this, this may be a reason for delaying that probate, even though, of course, it will end up delaying the distribution. If you file the probate later, after that one year, then as soon as the, person has, the, the, the personal representative has been appointed, the personal representative can then turn around and distribute the assets right away because all the creditors have already been wiped out. Um, and once again, the, one, of the, one of the pieces of probate is you need to figure out who is going to be in charge. That is now called the personal representative. Uh, if you have a will, it used to be called the executor. If, you have, if there is no will, it used to be called the administrator. Now it's all called the personal representative. So now what? Uh, how do you deal with probate before probate appointment? Well, what you have to do is you have to file a petition uh, the person who was named as the personal representative can file. Any beneficiary named in the will can file. Um, if there is no will, any of the heirs can file. Um, there are two pr uh, probate processes. One is called informal and one, ca one is called formal. Uh, formal requires that you jump through more hoops before the personal representative is appointed. However, formal would be necessary if it looks like there are go there's going to be arguments or people can't assent to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the petition or if there's real estate involved. If it is formal, then the process is once you have filed, the court will issue a notice called a citation. That notice will say to the, to the people who would otherwise have had an interest uh, in the absence of a will, that is the heirs, and also to everybody else, <clears throat> a will has been filed. And, the, and by, by the way, this is the notice that gets published in the paper. A will has been filed. Um, if you've got any objections to that will, or to the, 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 the approval of a, of a petition by someone saying there was no will, you have a given amount of time, typically about 30 days from the date of the issuance of that citation, to file an objection. After that period has passed, if there is an objection, the court will hear the objection. If there's no objection at that point, the court will issue uh, so-called letters testamentary, the, 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 the document signed by the probate judge um, that, a, that names that the uh, personal representative as the person who can now handle all of the assets. Once that has happened, and once those letters testamentary have been issued by the court, uh, the person who has been named will typically get a, go get a tax ID number from the IRS, and then go to the various banks where assets are located, and, and be, the, base, the banks will then give that personal representative a check payable to the estate based on show, the showing of that, that, uh, that certificate, the, the personal representative would then go about paying all the bills um, and waiting, waiting until the end of that one year creditor period, which can seem like forever, right? But remember, it is there as a short statute of limitation because it cuts off all creditors at the end of that one year. Uh, personal representatives can make early distributions. The only problem with doing that with that if you're the personal representative is that if you do that, and then a creditor shows up during that one year period and there isn't enough money left to pay the creditor, you're personally liable to the creditor. The personal representative would also be responsible for filing any, any uh, income taxes uh, of the deceased that hadn't been filed, as well as filing the estate tax. And we're going to talk about the estate tax, by the way, in a separate Bergeron Briefs episode. I try to do Bergeron Briefs uh, episodes, which are 15-minute segments dealing with a particular issue. Um, um, we, we can't, we're not going to deal with the specifics of the estate tax today because literally as we speak the legislature is debating whether to change a lot of those estate tax rules. So once the year is up, um, the personal representative would typically want to get an, a, a, do an accounting and send that accounting to anybody who's going to be getting any assets and tell it, as part of that accounting say here's what I'm proposing to give you to each of those distributees and then get a sense or releases from each one of those distributees. If the, the, what are the typical causes of trouble? Well, you know, we, I've, we've had these cases occur. We always call them family feuds, 
where, for example, maybe Peter has been named as the personal representative, but he hasn't been following through and nothing's been filed. Or you're concerned that Peter's taking money off the top, any number of things. If that is a concern to any one of the heirs or the, or the uh, people who are named under the will, they can always ask the court for an, to require that Peter do an accounting ahead of time. And if, they, if he's not doing a good job, those people can also get um, Peter removed as the, uh, the, um, the uh, named personal representative. Uh, if there is a will, the probate is exactly the same as, the, as intestate, as intestacy. Often, if there, is, if there is a will, that will will contain a so-called power of sale in it. That, and that power of sale will typically give the personal representative the ability to sell the property without any, getting any permission from the court, I accept that the proceeds then would have to continue to be held in probate until after that year, had, had, that year has gone up. Um, what about trusts? What about if assets had been put into trust of various kinds in order to avoid probate? Well, that's actually the topic for the next seminar. So, um, I hope you found this helpful. The point of all this is, and I think you can, you can tell, the theme of this is, if you're concerned about probate, you need to know how it works, um, and, you, and if you want to avoid it, there are ways to avoid it, and I've given you some of those ways. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I'll look forward to seeing you um, when I do the next seminar. Thank you very much.